Hi, everybody. My name is Alexandre Michy. I'm um, a cardiologist uh, practicing in France. Um, uh, I'm an car international cardiologist. So uh, welcome to the ISFTH uh, Working Group on Telecardiology webinar, uh, which uh, today is called Landmark, Landmark Trials in Heart Failure. So I have the pleasure to uh, co-host the webinar with um, the chair um, on the heart failure section of the working of our working group, Dr. Shelley Zero uh, from Canada. Hi, Shelley. I hope everything is uh, okay in Canada. Um, I would also like to uh, say uh, hi to the two vice chairs uh, of the heart failure section, Dr. Yas Moedi and Dr. Anju uh, Sower, which were recently appointed. Uh, so, without delaying further, I would like to give the word to Dr. Shelley Zirot, uh, which I uh, thank for putting uh, on such a great team today. Hi, Shelley. Great. Thank you so much, Alexandra. It's always a pleasure to be part of these webinars. And um, I've had the opportunity to gather for um, all of your members and the viewers um, some principal investigators for these clinical trials and national lead. So it really is a, a global event that we're having here. Uh, we're gonna start off with Professor Verma and then Professor Saldariga is gonna present. So we'll be doing Emperor, then Victoria, then we'll be doing Galactic with Professor Tierlink, and then finally Soloist from uh, Professor uh, Marissa Crespo-Lera. And of course, uh, no event like this would be uh, complete without us having also some Twitter presence as well. So we have uh, Dr. Nazreen Ibrahim joining us as well. There she is. Great to have you on board. And we're going to start things off with Professor Verma. Um, he is a fellow Canadian, uh, a true he for she for me, and he's Canada Research Chair in Cardiovascular Surgery, Professor of Surgery at the University of Toronto, world-renowned clinical trialists. Um, and without any further ado, we're going to let him take it away with an update for everybody on Emperor Reduced. Great. Uh, th thank you so much, Dr. Ziroth, and uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mishi, as well, for this wonderful intro introduction and opportunity, and congratulations on this uh, really, truly remarkable platform. Uh, it's, uh, it's really delightful for me to be part of it. So I have 10 minutes to give you uh, an update on the Emperor Reduced Trial. Shown in this slide are my disclosures. Leading up to the treatment trials of SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure, we had gathered tremendous insights from the diabetes trials in people with and without cardiovascular disease that demonstrated that SGLT2 inhibitors were highly efficacious at preventing heart failure. The question was, will these therapies emerge in the treatment of heart failure specifically? Are SGLT2 inhibitors drugs that can be used to uh, treat prevalent heart failure as opposed to just preventing incident heart failure? And specifically, the second question was, are these benefits in any way restricted to diabetes only, or are these benefits observed in all comers? So in that regard, there have been two trials. The first trial was DAPA-HF that was done in ambulatory patients with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction and that was followed by Emperor Reduced, done also in a relatively similar population, and that's the topic of today's discussion. We will be discussing Soloist at the end of today's presentation. So I'm going to dive straight into the Emperor Reduced trial results that were presented and published at the ESC meeting last year. The Emperor Reduced trial enrolled patients with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction, this was slightly different than the DAPA-HF trial. There are many similarities, but a few differences. The differences are actually listed here. Specifically, this trial actually enrolled patients with a slightly lower left ventricular ejection fraction compared to DAPA-HF. This was done by design. It was a so-called matrix between ejection fraction and NT-proBNP that resulted in patients having slightly more advanced left ventricular dysfunction and a higher baseline NT-proBNP. 
Emperor reduced also enrolled patients down to a GFR of 20 mils per minute per 1.73 meters square. And resultantly, the mean eGFR was actually numerically lower than DAPA HF. Background therapy was exceptionally uh, good in the Emperor reduced trial as well as in DAPA HF, but notably, uh, about 20% of patients actually were also treated with a angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor compared to about 10% or so in the DAPA HF trial. Background use of ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, uh, MRA was really high, and uh, about uh, one third of patients had an ICD, but 11% had a CRT device. Now, the primary outcome, which was the time to CV death or hospitalization for heart failure is shown here. And over a median follow-up of 16 months, there was a 25% relative risk reduction with empagliflozin 10 versus standard of care or placebo. That resulted in an NNT of 19 with a highly persuasive p-value. Further analyses that have now just been published in circulation over the last month or so suggests that the first statistical significance for the primary outcome was noted at 12 days following randomization. The individual components of the primary outcome, CV death and heart failure, were uh, driven largely through a reduction in first hospitalizations for heart failure, as you see here, uh, uh, reduced uh, by 31%. There was a numeric 8%, but non-statistically significant reduction in cardiovascular death. And whether that is simply a matter of power, duration of follow-up, uh, uh, et cetera, remains unclear, but certainly, in my opinion, is not related to biological differences between empagliflozin or dapagliflozin in that regard. The first hierarchical uh, endpoint following the primary endpoint was total hospitalizations for heart failure, first and recurrent. And shown here uh, are the key results, a 30% reduction in this uh, total heart failure burden, 553 events down to 388 events, again, highly statistically significant. <clears throat> Some newer data that was not presented in the original publication, look at total hospitalizations requiring IV presser or positive inotropic drugs. And this was also reduced significantly by about 33% with empagliflozin versus placebo. Total hospitalizations requiring admission to either the ICU or CCU likewise were reduced by 33% with a statistically significant result. Finally, these new data looking at time to first visit reporting intensification of diuretic therapy was also reduced by 33% with empagliflozin versus placebo. A broader composite was studied uh, in further exploratory analyses looking at all-cause mortality or hospitalization or an ER or urgent visit for heart failure, and that too was actually reduced by 33% with empagliflozin versus placebo. Now, the final endpoint of interest in the uh, hierarchical sequence was the change in EGFR slope. And in patients with or without diabetes that were enrolled in this trial down to a GFR of 20 with reduced ejection fraction, you actually see in blue that the rate of decline of the EGFR is approximately 2.3 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared per year. Compared to that, those individuals who got empagliflozin had a reduction in the slope, i.e. the decline in EGFR was approximately uh, almost entirely blunted, if I may, with empagliflozin compared to placebo, such that the differences in slopes were highly statistically significant, suggesting that empagliflozin in patients with HEFREF on top of standard of care delays renal progression. The more traditional composite renal endpoint is shown here, which is a composite of doubling of serum creatinine, end-stage renal disease, a 40% sustained reduction in EGFR or renal death, 
and that was reduced by 50% with empagliflozin versus placebo. Similar to DAPA-HF, the treatment was extremely well tolerated with no excess serious adverse events either related to a cardiac or renal disorder. There were no excess volume depletion, side effects, hypotension, symptomatic hypotension, ketoacidosis. The only real difference as expected was an excess in genital tract infections. <clears throat> in a updated publication in circulation just a few months back, now the effects of empagliflozin according to the categories of GFR have been described. And for the primary outcome of adjudicated heart failure or CV death, first or recurrent heart failure, or the composite kidney outcome, you see that there is an entirely consistent result of empagliflozin on all of the cardiorenal outcomes, even down to a GFR below 30 in this cohort. What about the result in people with and without diabetes? And this was published as well in a circulation paper, suggesting that in about half of the patient population that did not have diabetes as shown on the right, compared to those individuals that had diabetes, there was an entirely consistent benefit of empagliflozin, irrespective of the presence or absence of type two diabetes. If you looked at this relationship across the A1C spectrum, assuming either linearity on the left or by analyses of splines on the right, you see that it's an entirely straight line suggesting that the benefit of empagliflozin uh, on CV death or heart failure hospitalizations is independent of baseline A1C in the normal pre-diabetic or diabetic range. Recently, the outcomes in people with or without RNA have also been presented and shown here are those results. There was a substantially larger number of patients than DAPA-HF who were on RNA therapy. These patients tended to be extremely well treated. Their blood pressures were lower, but 118 versus 123. Their heart rate was lower, 69 compared to 71. More of these patients were on MRA, about half actually had an ICD, and on top of that, they were treated with an angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor. And you see here the remarkable results on the left, those patients with HEFREF on an ARNI uh, compared to those not on an ARNI have an entirely consistent benefit with respect to this therapy. Uh, similar benefits were seen with respect to first and recurrent heart failure hospitalizations. There was no excess in adverse side effects in those patients treated with an RNA and an SGLT2 inhibitor with respect to volume side effects, potassium, symptomatic hypotension, or worsening renal function. Let me just end in the last 30 seconds, I know uh, we're running out of time, to share with you the data on quality of life that Professor Butler has presented recently in the European Heart Journal demonstrating that there was an early and sustained improvement in quality of life as assessed by the KCCQ clinical summary score, and that these benefits were seen even on top of an ARNI as shown in this slide. Absolutely, last point to be made that not only are patient reported outcomes, but objective NYHA class improvement observed soon after treatment initiation, and these are also some newer data, that within four weeks of treatment initiation, more patients uh, actually uh, reported an improvement in NYHA class and fewer patients reported a deterioration. So I'd like to end by saying that really when you look at DAPA-HF and Emperor reduced in totality, as they have done in this patient, in this uh, trial level meta-analyses, published in The Lancet, both of these trials send a very consistent message with respect to a reduction in uh, heart failure outcomes and in fact, a reduction in cardiovascular death. So let me end by telling you that these have been uh, two uh, remarkable studies of SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And they may be two tales, but they tell us one story and that is that SGLT2 inhibitors have really come of age in the treatment of HEFREF uh, with or without diabetes.
and down to a GFR of 20 mils per minute for 1.73 meters square. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Verma, for this uh, magnificent presentation. Um, we will have to pass on to the um, next speaker, which uh, is Professor Clara Ines uh, Saldariaga, Associate Professor at University of uh, Antioquia, uh, Head of the Heart Failure Program um, at Clinica uh, Cardio in Medellin, Colombia. Um, so, Professor uh, Saldariaga will present uh, Victoria um, uh, data. Hi, Clara, how are you? Hi, Alexandru. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be today with you here and with all the audience. And I'm going to talk about Victoria trial. This is the landmark trial that I'm going to present in the next 10 minutes. Those are my disclosures, and this is the agenda that I'm going to cover in the next 10 minutes. First, I'm going to explain to you the population of patients that was studied in the Victoria trial and why worsening heart failure is an unmet need. Then I'm going to explain to you how this new drug works, how what benefit heart failure. Then I'm going to summarize for you the key learnings of the Victoria trial, and let me finish with the, some conclusions about how this evidence fits in today's practice. So worsening heart failure is definitely an unmet need. As you can see here in this graphic, once a patient is admitted to the hospital, after that, this patient has a worse prognosis. Those patients tend to deteriorate and to progress to advanced heart failure. And all of this happened even with the medical treatment that we have nowadays. So this is a window of opportunity to research about some other medications that can help those patients. So now let me explain to you how this very what works. So heart failure is a disease where we have a decrease in the sensitivity to nitric, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide binds to soluble guanylate cyclists and Bericiguat also binds to this receptor. And once Bericiguat binds to this receptor, it stabilizes uh, the union of nitric oxide and increase the levels of CGMP. When you have more CGMP, you can do good things for the vascular system, but also for the heart. You can decrease vascular stiffness to reduce fibrosis and left ventricular remodeling. So this was the theory about how this medication can help patients with worsening heart failure. And the first study was this, the Socrates Reduce. It was a phase two trial that was designed in order to test the doses of Bericiguat that decreased the levels of the natriuretic peptides. And after that, the Victoria trial, the first, the phase three study was developed and I'm going to summarize for you the key learnings of this trial. This trial was published and presented last year in the American College of Cardiology meeting. And the objective of this trial was first to prove the efficacy of Bericiguat and also to prove the safety of these medications. So the efficacy was defined as the reduction in the primary composite outcome of cardiovascular death or first heart failure hospitalization. And this trial also had some secondary outcomes, the first of the primary class or cause mortality. And finally, safety was defined as the presence of hypotension or the presence of syncope. Let me explain you the inclusion criteria of these trials. So this trial includes not just patients with chronic heart failure, but also patients that had a previous episode of worsening. How was this worsening defined? If the patient was admitted to the hospital or if the patient need the use of diuretics uh, IV in the emergency room. The admission to the hospital must be in the prior six months uh, to the inclusion of the patient in the trial. Those patients were excluded from, from this trial. Patients in the transplant list, also patients with advanced hepatic or, or lung disease, and those that were taking long-acting nitrates, phosphodesterase type 5 inhibitors, or riosiguat. 
As you can see here in this trial, the patient need to be in the top doses of the medication that was 10 milligrams. So once the patient was assigned to the treatment arm or placebo arm, it was an increase in the doses of the medications every two weeks in order to have the patients in the 10 milligram dose. Let me highlight some of the interesting baseline characteristics of this trial. So most of the population had a prior worsening heart failure episode in the last three months. And as you can see here, most of these patients were in New York Heart Association class three, four. This is something that we don't see that often in heart failure clinical trials. And 60% of this population were on triple therapy. And the use of devices like ICD or biventricular pacing was in one of every three patients. So it was a population that was well treated for heart failure. Now, let me, let me show you the results of the trial. So this is the primary uh, composite endpoint, uh, end cardiovascular death or first heart failure hospitalization. As you can see here, basically what compared to placebo, uh, it was a significant reduction in the primary outcome. And here you can see some of the secondary endpoints where uh, the reduction in cardiovascular death or first heart failure hospitalization was non-significant. And this is the subgroup analysis that was pre-specified for this trial, where you can see that the benefit was consistent in most of these uh, subgroups. What about the safety and tolerability of these medications? So 90% of the population get the target dose of Berisiquat, and symptomatic hypotension or syncope were numerically higher in the treatment group, but these results was non-significant. One of the findings, unexpected findings of this trial was the presence of anemia in 7.6% of the patients treated with Berisiquat compared to placebo, and this uh, secondary effect is not fully explained today. Now that brings me to my final part of this uh, talk, I'm going to show you the perspective of some other heart failure trials compared to Victoria. Here you can see that this population was sicker than the population that was included in DAPA HF, Emperor Reduce of, or Paradigm HF. Those patients had higher natriuretic peptides, worse renal function. And those are the results of Victoria trial in the context of these other trials. I want to highlight that the number of events in the placebo group was almost three times the number of events in the Paradigm HF. And that shows that this population was very sick. And those are the numbers if you compare the annualized event rates for every 100 patients per year at risk. But the study is continuous and we have new data from Victoria trial that I want to share with you. I'm going to show you three interesting sub-analyses that have been uh, presented or published recently. This is the first one is the results according to the index event. As you can see here, irrespective of the time of the worsening event, there is a benefit of this medication. But I want to show you in the blue line that those patients that had the prior hospitalization during the last three months were the patients with the higher number of events. And this is the Victoria echo sub analysis that was presented last year in the Heart Failure Association of the ASC meeting. Here you can see that the changes in the left ventricular ejection fraction of course in the group that was assigned to Perisiguat, but also in the group that was assigned to placebo, this difference was non-significant. And that brings us the question of how this medication works because reverse modeling seems not to be the explanation uh, of this. And finally, this is the analysis of the NT pro BMP levels uh, related to primary endpoint. And those patients with less than 8,000 um, NT pro BMP, those patients uh, seems to have, um, if you have less than 8,000, you seem to have all the benefit of this medication. So in conclusion, I show you a new medication, a new target for heart failure, and the reduction in the composite outcome of cardiovascular death or hospitalization. 
and this medication was well tolerated and without any safety concerns. And well, finally, what are the implications for telemedicine and telehealth? So let me tell you that worsening heart failure is an opportunity to develop telemedicine and telehealth. And when you are up titrating medication like Berisiquat, when you need to go on uh, for the next doses, to use interaction like this can help you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Clara, for that wonderful talk. Uh, we'll be joining, having you join us back um, during the Q&A at the end. And now I have the distinct honor to introduce Professor John Tierlink. He's Director of Heart Failure and ECHO at the University of California, San Francisco, where apparently the weather is much nicer than here right now. Um, and he was wearing his, his Go Red for Heart Month that we're having in uh, North America here right now as well. Um, and he's gonna present for us as the uh, lead investigator of Galactic HF. We're so honored to have you here today. It's a great to have this opportunity to speak to everybody. And uh, really, I, I want to thank uh, Shelly and Alexandru for, for inviting me to this, this fantastic uh, conference, including people from three different continents. So it's just lovely to have this opportunity to participate. So thank you. Um, I'll be discussing a bit about the Galactic HF um, results that was presented at the AHA as a late-breaking clinical trial. These are my um, disclosures. And I think you know most of us are aware that for over a hundred years we've been trying to improve cardiac performance with multiple agents that unfortunately have been shown to actually worsen outcomes in terms of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And those agents were largely all cardiac calcitropes. In other words, those were agents that improved cardiac function by altering the intracellular calcium fluxes. And these include agents like the catecholamines and phosphodiesterase inhibitors. There's a second emerging group known as the mitotropes, which are agents that improve cardiac performance by influencing energetics. And I won't be touching on these specifically, but it is interesting. We've heard from um, uh, Dr. Verma the, the, uh, in some, some of the data from the SGLT2 inhibitors. And actually one of the proposed mechanisms for why these agents may actually help cardiac function is through their beneficial influence on energetics. So maybe the SGLT2 inhibitors represent a class of the, or some of these mitotropes. The third way to improve cardiac performance is to try to directly affect the molecular mo motor and scaffolding. And um, this, this is the approach that we have taken in introducing the agent known as omacamptive macarbal. Omacamptive macarbal is a selective cardiac myosin activator. And it works by, if you look on the um, figure on the left-hand side, you can see a schematic of the interaction between the myosin head and the actin filaments. And between step um, one and two, there is this equilibrium between the um, pre-power stroke when the myosin head is ready to actually interact with the actin filament and produce force. And omicantin macarbal stabilizes the myosin head in this pre-power stroke state, increasing the, the likelihood and the rate of myosin entry into this tightly bound force producing state with the actin filament. And, and uh, the schematic on the illustration on the right gives a sense of what this is like. So without omicantin macarbal, you only have a few of the myosin heads pulling. Whereas if you have in the presence of omicantin macarbal, there are essentially more hands or myosin heads grasping and pulling on the rope, which is the actin filament, which produces more force. There was a whole series of other um, trials that led us to the Galactic HF study with um, omicamptive macarbal. Uh, I don't have time to go through them, but we did have the chance, and I, I want to highlight that Marissa crespo who's a, the speaker coming next, was one of our national leaders on this trial and, and fantastic being involved in the study. And we did have the opportunity to, to present this in, as well and publish it in the New England Journal just recently. And this trial enrolled 8,256 patients. And these patients were enrolled in a study to test a very novel hypothesis, which is by selectively improving cardiac function without any effects on vasoactive agents or anything along those lines, with this cardiac myosin activator, could we specifically improve clinical outcomes in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction 
or HEFREF. The patients enrolled in the trial are actually among the um, more advanced patients of any of the clinical trials. They had chronic heart failure, even more patients than Victoria who were in class three and four, lower ejection fraction, of ejection fraction less than or equal to 35%, elevated natriuretic peptides who were on standard heart failure therapies. We included 25% of the patients who were actually already hospitalized for acute heart failure. And then the other three quarters of the patients came who, who also had worsening of heart failure within a year with an urgent emergency department visit or a heart failure hospitalization within that year. The patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either omicamp to mecarbol, which was titrated with a pharmacokinetically guided dose selection, going from 25 up to 50 milligrams PO twice a day, compared to placebo patients who were also treated on standard of care therapies. These are more details of the inclusion criteria. Um, as well as some of the exclusion criteria. The exclusion criteria are important because this trial is one of the few trials ever to enroll patients with a systolic blood pressure below 100. As well, we had uh, patients with estimated EGFRs down to um, 20 mLs per minute per 1.73 meters squared. And then there are the kind of typical exclusion criteria. So this is a very broadly um, enrolling trial. It enrolled also from in multiple international areas. The distribution is shown here on the bottom of the left-hand figure. And the baseline characteristics are um, consistent with other trials, though we actually enrolled more black patients than in any other trial um, in contemporary heart failure. The mean age is 65 years of age. As already mentioned, 25% of the patients were inpatients. The ejection fraction was 27% on mean and almost half, 47% were NYJ class three and four. The natriuretic peptides were um, some of the highest in any of the trials with a lower mean um, blood pressure than in many trials. And the uh, contemporary therapy was also as good as or better than most of the clinical trials, as well as the same with the device therapy. Importantly, we only had one patient lost to follow up for vital status in this study. So we have a very good database of very well treated patients to examine the question of can omicantum macarbal improve outcomes. And this is the primary endpoint of time to first heart failure event or cardiovascular death, which was significantly improved by omicamp and mecarbal compared to placebo patients. This endpoint was a composite of first heart failure event, which was the main driver of the beneficial effect. And omicamp and mecarbal had no <clears throat> effect on cardiovascular death. There was a suggestion of an improvement in the Kansas City cardiomyopathy total symptom score in the patients who enrolled as inpatients but no beneficial effect apparent in the patients who are enrolled as outpatients. And overall, this joint test p-value of 0.028 did not meet the pre-specified level for us to say that there was overall a benefit in the KCCQ symptom score in this trial. Now, importantly, when you look at the subgroup analyses, and these are the pre-specified subgroup analyses from Galactic HF, the main message is across the board, there was a consistent beneficial effect of omicamp and mecarbal throughout almost all the subgroups viewed. Now, if you want to go kind of a little more into the weeds, one can see that in patients such as the, in the sicker patients, patients such as the inpatients, patients with class three, four, reduced ejection fractions, higher NT pro BNPs, lower blood pressures, as well as those patients who were receiving device therapy because of their more advanced disease, they tended to have better um, benefit from omicamp and mecarbal. More importantly and more interesting, there was one subgroup where there was absolutely no overlap of the confidence intervals with an interaction p-value of 0.003. And this suggests that it's really unlikely that this is due just to chance. And so in this group with the patients who had an ejection fraction less than or equal to 28%, they had a 16% reduction in the overall risk of the events. So I'm about to show you some preliminary data, some preliminary showings of looking at the effect of omicamp and mecarbal on the primary composite endpoint by ejection fraction. And you can see that as the ejection fraction decreased, you would have improvement in the outcomes of these patients. 
suggesting that this drug, which improves cardiac function, works better in patients with worse cardiac function, which has some biological plausibility to it. And once again, as a preliminary analysis, you can see that when you take the ejection fraction of 28%, um, that gives the 16% reduction uh, in the hazard ratio with an absolute risk reduction of almost 5%. And if you add any other factor of these other factors that suggest the patients are more clinically ill, you can see dramatic increases in the um, uh, absolute risk reduction up to 8% absolute risk reduction in the, um, in the event of cardiac death or heart failure hospitalizations. Importantly, there was absolutely no adverse effect on blood pressure, heart rate, potassium, or creatinine. There was a significant reduction in NT pro BMP, as well as a mild um, increase in cardiac troponin I. The adverse events were similar between omecanthin macarbal and placebo, with the exception of the adjudicated strokes which with almost 200 adjudicated strokes, we had a 32% reduction in that, end, in that adjudicated endpoint. So we have an agent that improves cardiac function that does not adversely affect ischemia, does not adversely affect arrhythmias, and, and does not have any adverse effect on, my, on major cardiovascular events. So I'd like to conclude with kind of a so what. So, so what, where do we take away from galactic HF? Well, galactic HF, patients, inpatients with HEFREF, omicantum macarbal, statistically, significantly, and clinically meaningfully reduce the risk of a primary composite outcome. Importantly, the adverse events, including myocardial ischemia and ventricular arrhythmias, were similar between omicantum and placebo group. And the absence of adverse effects on blood pressure, heart rate, renal function, potassium, suggests that omicantum macarbal can only be initiated without interfering with the initiation or titration of other GDMT. And this has implications for telemedicine in as much as this agent may be very easy to initiate and give to patients in the telemedicine setting. It, this is the first time that we've been able to demonstrate that selectively improving cardiac function resulted in improvement cardiac outputs. And as I suggested by some of the preliminary analyses of, of, the, uh, of the ejection fraction, GLAT further analyses will be able to provide greater insight into subgroups who may demonstrate greater benefits, such as these patients with lower ejection fraction, in whom improving cardiac function may have a greater role. So thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to some great questions from this fantastic panel and audience. Thank you so much, John. Um, we had um, around 800 subscribers for this webinar. Uh, of course, not all of them uh, could connect today. Uh, so thank you so, so much to all of you, in fact, uh, for, for your uh, uh, time, uh, which I know is very valuable. So um, further on, uh, I will give the word to uh, Professor Marisa crespo Leiro, uh, which is the head of Heart Failure and Transplant Unit at the uh, hospital, um, uh, university, uh, university Hospital uh, La Coruña in Spain. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Crespolero will present a soloist um, study. Como estas, uh, Marisa? Todo bien? <laughs> so you have to activate your uh, sound. Now? Yeah. Now? We, I, we can hear you, yeah. Can you hear me? So now I'm going to try to share my slides. Could I share my, my desk? Yes, please go no. ahead and try. If not, I will share my screen. Well, I, I prefer to use mine, but you are inhabilitated my function. Try again, please. Perfect. We can see your screen. Here we go. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. So, good evening from La Coruña, Spain. Um, first of all, I would like to thank very much the organizer, special Dr. Shelley Serrot and Dr. Alessandro Misi for inviting me, and I am delighted to participate. So, what I'm going to present is the soloist worsening heart failure. These are my disclosures. I'm going to start with this word, serendipity, which is finding something good without looking for it. 
And according to this very nice uh, publication from Dr. Deepa Bhatt and Dr. Brownwell, serendipity is to be credited for many advances in medicine and the story of SDLT2 inhibitors is nothing short of that. These uh, drugs representing a major therapeutic advance in medicine, treating hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes patients, several of them showed to lower the risk of hospitalization for heart failure among diabetes patients, and some of them showed to reduce the risk of death from cardiovascular causes or hospitalization for heart failure in patients with heart failure with or without uh, diabetes. And this is dapaglyphosine, dapa heart failure, and empaglyphosine in period reduced that already was presented this afternoon. So there are very uh, mechanisms proposed uh, in which SHL2 protects cardiorenal protection and also reduction of risk of heart failure. Diuresis, increased naturesis, glucosuria, decreased proteinuria, um, preload uh, and decrease afterload, and also at the level of energetics. So here we have this major clinical trial, soloist worsening heart failure, with the study of glyphosine in patients with diabetes and recent worsening heart failure. Well, and the reason is the safety and potential efficacy of initiating SGLT2 to inhibitors soon after a episode of decompensated worsening heart failure remain uncertain, and the potential safety concerns are based by hypotension or precipitation of kidney failure with fluctuating volume status and renal function who are receiving drugs that might affect renal filtration rate, and also the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is unknown. So, so taglyphosine is a dual uh, SGLT2-1 and S SGLT2 inhibitors. So also provides some gastrointestinal inhibition. So SGLT2 inhibition increases the glucose excretion in urine, whereas the SGLT2-1 inhibition reduces the postprandial glucose level by delaying intestinal glucose absorption. So the hypothesis is very well illustrated by this figure from Dr. Berma and colleagues is that sotaglyphosine would reduce the risk of death from cardiovascular causes, hospitalization for heart failure, and urgent visit for heart failure among patients with diabetes and recent worsening of heart failure with either reduced or preserved ejection fraction when administered soon after an episode of decompensated heart failure. This is the vulnerable period of an admission for worsening heart failure. The key inclusion criteria, patients in 18 to 85 years, admission with signs and symptoms of heart failure, treatment with IV diuretics, has to be stabilized of a oxygen and transitioning to oral diuretics, there were a requirement of NT pro BNP or BNP, NT pro BNP higher than 600, and also patients has to be diabetics. And there were key exclusion criteria: the patient was on end stage heart failure, with recent ACS stroke, PCR or cabbage, and also um, poor renal function, so estimated lumal filtration rate less than 30. And this is the design. Patients who met all eligibility criteria and stability were randomly assigned either before or within three days after hospital discharge to receive 200 milligrams of sotaglyphosine once daily with an increase to 400 milligrams depending on the side effects or placebo. Follow-up visits were scheduled for at one, two, and four weeks and at four months and every four months thereafter. They were stratified by levitical ratio fraction less than 50% or higher than 50% and also by geographic region. Well, and now we have to say this is one of the problems we face it that as a consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
on non-COVID-19 clinical trials. So we know that there were a lot of funding during the onset of the, this pandemic and was a major challenge for ongoing clinical trials. And we know that academic leadership is everything to ensure patient safety and to contribute as much as possible to a scientific knowledge. What happened with solo is worsening in heart failure where were ended prematurely in March 2020 because of loss of funding, loss of funding from the sponsor. At that time, 1,222 patients were included and it was decided to change the primary endpoint from first occurrence of either death from cardiovascular causes or hospitalization for heart failure to the total number of deaths from cardiovascular causes a hospitalization for heart failure and also urgent visits for heart failure, first and subsequent, in order to increase the power of the trial. And also now the endpoint were based on investigator defined events. This is the consort diagram, 32 countries participating and 306 sites. So uh, from the randomized patients, uh, Sotaglifosin completed the study 588 and in placebo 591. The, mean, the, the median time of follow-up was around nine months. And these are the baseline characteristics. Uh, around the age was around the 70 years. Um, more than 70% were male. A representation um, most important in Europe and Americas. NT pro BMP around 1,800 uh, NT pro BMP and a, a higher number of patients on RASI inhibitor, 91% in each um, arms, and any glucose lower medication, 85 around the, uh, the two arms. And this is the result. This is the primary efficacy endpoint total cardiovascular death hospitalization for heart failure and urgent heart failure visit, and was demonstrated the superiority of sotagliflozin with a, high, a very high p-value. But also was very uh, notorious that it was the benefit was already significant by 28 days. So this is a very early effect of sotagliflozin in this uh, curve, as it showed that at 28 dates. This is the total cardiovascular death and hospital hedge for heart failure, in which clearly show that sotaglifosin was also um, demonstrated a clear benefit. And also when we study the first of cardiovascular death of heart hospitalization for heart failure was also benefic benefit in the sotaglifosin arm. And this is the results according to the efficacy testing hierarchy. So as I mentioned, the, the primary endpoint, total cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure or urgent heart failure visit, show superiority of sotagliflozin and also many other endpoints. However, it didn't show benefit cardiovascular death and all-cause death. Changing EGFR uh, showing benefit after uh, four weeks, and also improvement in quality of life according to the C KCCQ at 12 months to month four benefit for sotaglifosin. Regarding the primary efficacy, satisfied by um, pre-specified uh, ejection fraction was in both higher on uh, less than 50%, and also either if it was started before discharge, or after discharge was beneficial benefit of sotaglifosin. Regarding adverse events, there were two higher um, percentage of adverse events in diarrhea and severe hypoglycemia in the group of sotaglifosin. So regarding the limitations, this trial was stopped early before the initial planned sample because of loss of funding from the sponsor. Nevertheless, robust reduction in primary endpoint was seen and shortened duration limited the statistical power to see significant reductions in other endpoints like cardiovascular death or in kidney endpoints. Primary endpoint was changing while blending to the results. However, 
original primary endpoint was also strongly positive. An investigative reported events were used instead of adjudication. However, was a double blind trial, so there were no reason to expect bias. In conclusions, in patients with acutely compensated heart failure, Sota Glifloslin significantly reduced the composite of total cardiovascular deaths, hospitalization for heart failures, and urgent visits for heart failure by 33%, with an early benefit that was significantly by one month, and a number needed to treat of only four patient years. So with careful patient selection, close monitoring, and early initiation of sotagliflozine was generally well tolerated, similar to placebo, and the benefits were consistent across subgroups, including initiation prior to or soon after hospital discharge, and in heart failure with the reduced or preserved ejection fraction. And this is my um, thanks to the all study committees and also the national coordinators. And my last comment is the consideration. We know that the five pillars of heart failure reduced ejection fraction with a uh, sacubitid valsartan, beta blockers, MRA, and SHLA2. And regarding solo is clearly shows the rationale for the use and perhaps other uh, SGL2 also in patients just recovered for a worsening heart failure episodes. And it represents another opportunity for patients with heart failure. And thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marissa. And I would ask that our, uh, our panelists all join us uh, for a discussion. And um, it's so exciting to go over what a year we had in HEFREF clinical trials. Isn't it amazing? We started off with, I mean, we had really triple therapy, right? Then we grew to quadruple therapy over the last couple of years. Mm. Um, with Victoria, I started talking about Five Alive and now Galactic. I mean, the options are endless. I, I think what I wanna start off with, uh, maybe John, how do you pick how do you pick which drug? Is there a patient profile for omicamptive? So I think, Shelley, the thing I'd like to start with is as cool as all these new drugs are, and they are very cool and wonderful, I think that the message we really need to get across is we have to use them. So our, our four pillars of the ARNI, the beta blocker, the MRA, and the SGLT2 inhibitors we actually need to use them. So um, I'm convinced that Varesaguat and Omicaptin Macarbol both have places in the, and now I'm going to use one of the words that we have to use in every talk, in the current armamentarium. Um, but you know, <laughs> the uh, so Omicaptin Macarbol I think has a very wonderful place clinically in as much as because it doesn't affect blood pressure, heart rate, creatinine, or potassium, it can pretty much be added anywhere into the, the therapeutic regimen of a, of a patient. But it obviously should not be added to everybody. And I think the trial overall enrolled patients had EFs less than 35%. So I think it's perfectly appropriate for all of those patients. But I think there's clear evidence that there's even a better benefit in patients with lower ejection fractions. So that's kind of, I don't know if that addresses your question, but I think that gives a sense of where I think we're headed. Yeah, I really like that slide that Marissa showed at the end. Um, I think it, it brings it all together, all the changes in half ref. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I had a question. I think uh, I can direct this to Professor Marissa. Uh, I wanted to know, do you think future trials will be uh, based on, uh, you know, looking at personalization of guideline directed medical therapies? figuring out which patients you know, derive the most benefit from which therapies, as opposed to everybody gets everything. Because again, like Dr. Teeling said, we're not doing a great job at that right now. Or would trials like that not be in the best interest of uh, pharma? Thank you. Uh, wonderful question. Well, for sure. I think every patient is different. And it's different in, in all. In etiology, in physiopathology and how the patient is. So it, the patient who could be a benefit for um, SHL82 when after admission is not the same that a doctor uh, 
John Tierling show uh, because it's in a stage heart failure. So and all, and what is good for one patient is not good for the for the other. And yes, for sure, we have to identify with other patients who benefit uh, for uh, each uh, medicine. So about, I'm going to ask you um, about implementation, about, you know, it's one thing to put these drugs in the guidelines, it's another thing to prescribe them. Any advice on prescribing um, in, you know, in your practice, are there ones that you find easier than others? So I, I think you, you really, you really hit the nail uh, on the head here. Uh, and that is that, you know, this is an embarrassment of riches, right? We have so many choices, but yet, as John has mentioned time and again, when you go and measure it, you've seen this in Canada in your role as the president of the Canadian Heart Failure Society as well, Shelley, that the use of these therapies is uh, triple therapy is in the single digits, right? So it's, uh, it's really a, a major impediment moving forward as to how do we integrate these therapies. So I've learned from, from you a lot, Shelley, about this as well over the last few years. And that is that, you know, this concept of, uh, you know, getting the therapies uh, on board as quickly as possible, even without up titrating the doses necessarily to target dose, maybe one such approach. Uh, Professor McMurray and uh, Professor Milton uh, Packer have recently written in circulation a very provocative and, uh, you know, uh, interesting viewpoint on sequencing. And I know you're leading a sequencing effort in Canada too. And, and their approach was uh, to use, uh, you know, a, a beta blocker and an SGLT2 inhibitor as a first line therapy followed by, uh, you know, a RAS blocker, sorry, uh, uh, followed by an RNA, followed by an MRA in that sequence. It's an unusual sequence, but uh, trying to achieve that within three weeks, as opposed to, uh, you know, longer uh, that, that it usually takes and, and trying to do that by initiating, uh, you know, the starting doses of therapy without necessarily up titrating until all of those strategies on, are on the table. But specifically, uh, I think from an SGLT2 inhibitor standpoint, initiating them in hospital based on what we've heard from soloists is a really good opportunity soon after patients have been stabilized and prior to discharge. That helps overcome inertia for sure. Uh, it's actually uh, quite easy to use. You can use it without any renal uh, dysfunction related side effects that often are a concern. They're pretty good with potassium. In fact, if anything can lower potassium in people on an MRA, uh, they're not that uh, hemodynamically labile, if I may. So. Uh, all of those things, I think, uh, really uh, bode well for this class of agents. So I think early initiation in hospital or soon thereafter can help be help counter uh, sort of inertia moving forward. And the last point I'll say is that cardiologists, when it comes to SGLT2 inhibitors, often think that they're still diabetes drugs. And we have to demystify that, that they're not diabetes drugs. They're drugs everyone with and without diabetes, and they don't cause hypoglycemia, and they don't cause DKA, uh, you know, in people without diabetes, and even in people with diabetes, those rates are quite low. Sorry for the long answer. No, that's uh, great, and uh, we just lost Clara for one second, and she came back. Wonderful, perfect timing, Clara. Let me ask you really quickly, there's a question from Columbia. How do you do it? Do you start low doses of all four? Do you do one at a time and take six months? I mean, there is an urgency now to treat HEF-REF. And then we're gonna give Dr. Ibrahim the, the mic back. I like the approach to start the small doses of everything. I think that the message of this trial is to start early and treat well your patients and get the target doses as soon as you can. But it's better a little bit of everything that just two or three medication in higher doses. Dr. Ibrahim, you had a provocative question to tackle. 
Yes, so I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Tierlink because this is more a problem in the US than I think in Europe. Again, I've never practiced in Europe, so I don't know. But the cost of these medications, you know, like it's so amazing what um, RNEs do. It's so incredible what SGLT2 inhibitors do. But even with insurance, sometimes these medications are um, unaffordable. So I just want to make sure that um, we address and we acknowledge that. But how can we Again, I'm an early career person, so I'm probably naive, but how can we fight industry and insurance companies so that the most vulnerable and disadvantaged patients have the same access to drugs as the CEO of Google, for example? Right. No, so, so remember, I work at a socialist organization, the Veterans Affairs Hospitals. One of the reasons I work here is because you know, the VA can actually negotiate prices. So uh, with the, with the federal government, that we can actually do that. One of the things it's not so, you know, the, the industry is, does what they can do. And they can do this because our elective representatives who are highly influenced by some of those uh, people did not allow the United States government to negotiate prices with the industry. <laughs> Uh, unlike every other country in the world. So um, yes, it is an issue from pharma, but it actually is, is more of an issue of our, our political and economic structure here in the United States. But, but, and, but, and cost is an important issue, but even now when ACE inhibitors are dirt cheap, beta blockers are dirt cheap, MRAs are dirt cheap, MRAs are some of the cheapest medicines in the United States, yet they are the ones that we use the least frequently. So the United States has a lot of peculiar issues. Um, even if we were to get just patients on those three, we would be doing tremendous benefit for folks. So um, cost is a very important issue. We need to address it and it needs to be addressed on a national and political level. But we also need to kind of not use it as a scapegoat for us not doing the good work that we need to do in terms of getting patients on life-saving therapies. I will now step down from my soapbox, sorry. And Marissa, any comments from from Spain? I know there, you know, there there are issues even with um, accessibility of certain drugs like SGLT2 inhibitors in certain countries in Europe are only able to be prescribed by endocrinologists. So, any comments there? Oh, I don't, I don't, I can't prescribe um, SGLT2. I cannot prescribe omega-10-becarbe because it's not uh, already in the market, but I have no any issue, any problem to prescribe essentially to inhibitors. The cardiologists can do it. And Spain is a national health system that we don't have um, any problems in prescribing um, essentially to ARNI, no, no problem. Clara? Well, uh, for us, Sacubitril Valsartan is reimbursed if you just fill the papers. And um, for ISGLT2, if the patient has diabetes, it's approved and is reimbursed. But the approval for heart failure treatment is coming maybe for the next six months. And certainly um, in Canada, um, it, it is accessible, but there is still often a residual cost that falls on the shoulders of the patient. Um, and really advocacy plays a big part in that increasing heart failure awareness. I mean, uh, we are gonna have a Canadian national campaign in May. Yours in the US is uh, next week, right? The 14th or so starts, right? And I'll, I'll be uh, supporting that as well. But, you know, Sabode often starts all of his talk saying, you know, the prognosis for heart failure is often worse than many cancers. And so increasing that awareness with policymakers, decision makers, administrators is so, so important. Um, I just want to take, I, Alex, give me a few minutes here. Just I want to twist, we talked a lot about HEFREF today, but um, Sabode, the, uh, the baseline characteristics for Emperor Preserved uh, are, um, lighting up Twitter right now. Actually, Marissa is lighting up Twitter as well. <laughs> the world loves Marissa <laughs> um, on Twitter. But what about preserved? What's coming down the, you know, down the road for preserved ejection fraction? 
Uh, I think the emperor preserved is the next study. Uh, and I think the baseline characteristics paper is just out. Uh, hopefully at the ESC meeting, that's the, that's the thought at this point. Um, you know, uh, still no insights at this point. And then following that is deliver. And uh, again, again uh, Shelly, you're involved in, in, in deliver as well. There's uh, uh, other trials uh, that are ongoing with uh, finerenone in HEFPEF uh, as well that have just uh, just gotten started. Uh, the fine arts that, that you're quite, quite aware of, uh, Shelly, as well. Uh, so, you know, SGLT2 inhibitors, and then there's the determined studies, which are the functional studies that have still not been uh, published or presented yet. Uh, we do have some insights from Emperor, not Emperor, uh, Imperial Preserved, which were, uh, you know, really neutral, if I may, with respect to the primary outcome. So uh, it's, it's really hard to tell. Uh, hanging out with heart failure experts like yourself, I've learned that it's, uh, uh, you know, it can go both ways, really, uh, at this point. Uh, so everybody is hopeful, but uh, we don't know yet. I just want to uh, remind people that Emperor Preserve, the EF cutoff is 40%. So, you know, if there is uh, some leeway, if I may, between the 40 to 50, you know, uh, it may be slightly different than some of the prior trials that have looked at 50% or higher, for example. So uh, we are, we went a little bit over time because I just wanted to take the opportunity to have more discussion with all of our panelists. Um, I'd like to hand it back over to Alexandru um, to close and to remind everybody that this is, uh, this has been recorded um, and is, will be available for those who subscribe to the, the webinar as well. Thank you very much for participating to all our distinguished speakers. It really was an honor bringing this group together. Well, oh, thank you, Shelley. That was wonderful. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much, Shelley. Thank you, Nasrian. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you, John. Thank you, Subod. Um, thank you uh, uh, all. Thank you, Clara. This, this has been a real pleasure. So um, the webinar will uh, is recorded and uh, it will be um, uh, shared uh, very soon. Um, we had a huge audience and I hope we do it again. Uh, I was just wondering in, in, uh, if in uh, about six months or one year, we should uh, just um, uh, stop using uh, uh, beta blockers or uh, um, ACE inhibitors on the for the benefit of the other drugs. But this is just, you know, like a crazy thought. <laughs> no, everybody says no. <laughs> this is why you are the expert. Uh, <laughs> Was that subtle enough for you? <laughs> All of us, no! No! 100% no! <laughs> very clear. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, and uh, I really hope to see you uh, very soon. Um, and uh, um, please uh, stay stay um, online for our future webinars. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Good job, folks. Bye. Keep Bye, positive, everyone. test negative. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a nice Bye. evening. Bye. -bye. Bye.